According to then contemporary jurisprudential theory, all law could be divided into four basic categories. First, the law of nature. Second, the jus gentium, or the law of nations. Third, the jus civile, that is the municipal law or the positive law uh, of individual kingdoms and territories. And fourth, the jus divinum, the law of God that had been given to, uh, to Christians. Subdivisions had to be hived off within each of these categories to do justice to the complexity of human life. But these four things were the basic divisions of law. They were different, but they were not independent. And I think that's uh, important. And that's the relevant point for understanding what Magna Carta was in its own time. The law of nations and the municipal law were understood as putting into more detailed form the general prescriptions that were found within the law of nature and uh, within divine law too. But these two, the law of nations and the municipal law, were not identical. The jus gentium, the law of nations, was shared by all civilized peoples, whereas each individual land was free to adopt an individual rule or statutes suitable for its own situation. And everywhere this had happened, in fact. Italian law was different from Spanish law, but both of them depended upon the law of nature, and both of them were consistent with the law of civilized nations. So, for example, the law of nature pr uh, provided that parents had an obligation to provide for the, their young. Even animals uh, obeyed that law, or at least most of them. The jus gentium put that principle into the form of an obligation enforceable in law, one that had to be respected and was respected by all nations. And the jus civile, that is the municipal law's function, was to provide statutory remedies and specific penalties to be imposed upon neglectful parents so that the obligation could be understood and enforced in local practice. In other words, in the contemporary understanding, one moved from the general to the specific. It was something like the difference between the U.S. Constitution and current statute law. The Constitution states principles of law in general terms, and statute law is supposed to be congruent with them. The Constitution says we're entitled to due process of law before our property is taken by the government. Statute law says that we also have a right to fair compensation if our property is taken, and that this assessment of its value is to be made by an impartial tribunal. Of course, the, the parallel is not exact. Natural law is more general, and many provisions of the US Constitution are parts of the municipal, the positive law. However, I, I do hope you see the parallel. The two sources of law were supposed to be in harmony, and if they weren't, something had gone wrong. Judicial review of legislation is one way of securing that harmony, but it's not the only way. And of course, our courts, our courts have gone far beyond what any jurist living in 1215 could have imagined. Real differences between these sources of law existed. The natural law could not be changed, for example, whereas the law of nations and municipal law could. This isn't the time to go through the distinctions and qualifications that were necessary to make this scheme work, though they do interest some lawyers. The essential thing is that all four sources of law were necessary, and they were all supposed to work in harmony to achieve law's main goal, the goal of rendering due justice to all people. I wonder if you can see uh, how this scheme matters for the meaning of Magna Carta in 1215. I don't think it's particularly complicated, but it's a little bit hard to see. Most of Magna Carta, as in other statements of law adopted in other European nations around the same time, Magna Carta was a statement of municipal law, positive law, that grew out of both the law of nature and the law of nations. It also incorporated divine law for the liberty of the church found in the chapters, in the charter's first chapter was no part of natural law. The English church did not exist in the Garden of Eden. But God had spoken to the point. I know that some of you are familiar with the abundant controversial literature that emerged during the investiture controversy and that continued long afterwards. 
And I need not remind you that Pope Innocent III found in the Bible evidence to prove that he and other popes had been granted plenitude of power on earth. Freedom of exercising that power, particularly freedom from secular control, was regarded as a necessary component of that power. And chapter one of Magna Carta, which you have on your handout, put that principle into a more definite form. It would not, therefore, have been regarded simply as a reiteration of one clause in King Henry I's coronation charter, but as a recognition within the municipal law of England of a fundamental principle of the law that God himself had made known to all Christians. In other words, under the prevailing assumption of the time, Magna Carta's first chapter provided an example of how legal principle became enforceable law, jus cogens, if you like. It wasn't a perfect statement, for it left open exactly what the English church's freedom meant in particular circumstances, but it surely applied to Episcopal elections. And as Sir James Holt, the main stu student in modern times of Magna Carta concluded, its imprint, that is the imprint of the chapter one, came to, he said, quote, infect the whole of the charter. And that's exactly the function the classical jurisprudential system I've been describing was thought to serve. Contemporaries would not have used, would have used a different word than infect. They didn't consider the natural law to be a virus but they did assume that it should stand behind and influence the content of the positive law, and that's exactly what happened in the formulation of Magna Carta. I'll ask you now to look at, have a look at some of the provisions on the handout, and I'll use them to try to explain how the great principles from, drawn from the law of nature and from divine law were worked out in detail in the charter. An unlikely but not unusual at all example is provided by uh, chapter 33. Chapter 33 read, henceforth all kaidels shall com be completely removed from the Thames and the Medway and throughout all England. A very strange chapter it seems and quite anomalous, quite out of place in a charter of English liberties. A kaidel is a fish weir which is a fence of snakes placed in a river and used in order to catch and preserve, uh, to catch fish swimming in the river. What does that have to do with liberty? For that matter, what does it have to do with baronial self-interest? It looks a good deal more comprehensible, however, if we consider it in relation to the law of nature. Under natural law principles, the seas and other navigable waters were res nullius, that is, no one owned them. In the absence of special circumstances, their use was open to all. To erect a fish weir, an obstruction placed in a river, was thus to interfere with a natural right held by all men, the right to free passage over nav navigable waters. You may remember that the freedom of the seas would become the great theme of Mare Liberum by Hugo Grotius in the uh, 17th century. Here it is in the 13th century in an only slightly different context. Placing an obstacle like a fish weir in a navigable river abridged a natural right. It was a local grievance, but within it lay a large principle. Much the same can be said of the second two chapters on your handout. The first, in the, chapter eight, based on the free choice in marriage, in this case, in a specific case, the free marriage of widows, is one of those examples of freedom in what we call a basic life choice that was established as part of the law of the medieval church. The second gave details about how immersements, that is the equivalent of modern fines, would be set. It protected merchants and even serfs from arbitrary fines. Here the underlying natural principle was that of proportionality in punishment. It's an important matter. Three strikes and you're out is a model, mo modern example of a law that skates very close to the edge of the principle's violation. Some say it violates it. Analysis of chapter 39, perhaps the most famous among the charter's contents, is not vastly different 
Just to remind you, it's been claimed that the chapter guaranteed the right to a trial to jury in criminal cases. It does say something like that in stressing the necessity for the lawful judgment of the peers before you could be imprisoned or destroyed. Now, it's true that Chapter 39 could not have meant to guarantee the right to jury trial in 1215. No such thing existed. However, the chapter did state clearly that the king would not take punitive action against any free man unless he did so by lawful means. And it turned out that the English law came to adopt jury trial as the ordinary way of trying people who were accused of a crime. Of course, this was a product of choice. The governments of most European lands chose a different path. However, the right to a fair trial was what mattered under the law of nature. And in the municipal law of England, that right soon came to be understood as including the right to be tried by an impartial jury. Having chosen jury trial as a part of the municipal law, English jurists and even kings were then bound to respect it as one part of the law of the municipal law. And it was a right anchored in a larger right of the law of nature. Well, so what? I think, assuming what I've said is true, as I believe it is, it matters. I think it has a collateral benefit. Besides helping us to better understand what Magna Carta meant in its own time, it helps to explain some of the later uses of Magna Carta, and even perhaps some of, uh, we hear some echoes of it today. That's been the primary subject uh, of interest to historians. And if they, of course, they've noticed how frequently the charter was used as a source of rights. Historians have sometimes treated these uses as pure invention. But in fact, many of them followed from an accepted way of interpreting legal text in 1215 and throughout the later Middle Ages. Lawyers saw within these texts a mind containing basic principles, one not confined necessarily to their specific terms. And that mind became a legitimate means of expanding the reach of specific provisions. And some of the uses to which the Great Charter was later put become less surprising and I think more interesting as examples of this method of statutory interpretation. That is the text in a specific context stated a basic underlying principle which could be applied and was naturally applied to different circumstances. It's not wholly unlike the way the text of the Bible itself was then read. And I think we need to recover that assumption of jurisprudence if we are more fully to understand the later uses made of the charter's provision. Words in a statute might be understood as containing magnum in parvo. They might contain a meaning that extended beyond the specific instance in which they were invoked. What lawyers did with the text of Magna Carta in later century was to apply this method to the terms of Magna Carta. It may sometimes look like invention or naivete or even worse to us, but it did not to them. <laughs>